Thanks for uh, being here today. I uh, hope you enjoyed this morning as much as I did. Uh, it was fantastic to hear from people like Lisa Sue and John Kelly who have a perspective uh, like few others and about things that have worked in the past, uh, but also the, the challenges and the opportunities that we have facing us. It was also great to hear from uh, representatives from across the government to see that there really is an appetite uh, for you know, doing something big uh, and for the priority uh, that we all place on microelectronics. And I think that really sets up, uh, to me, uh, the theme of the afternoon. Uh, so it's a pleasure to introduce this afternoon's session. Uh, and I really want to emphasize what the message is to me, which is collaboration. And we heard a little bit about collaboration earlier, uh, but I really want to emphasize that uh, because uh, I think that really it is the collaboration between the different parts of the ecosystem that are going to make ERI make a difference, uh, that are going to make it have impact, uh, and that are going to make it matter. So the fundamental premise is that collaboration between the commercial semiconductor industry and our defense base, the government, and academia is as relevant today as ever. And the model for doing that, the model for that collaboration and for making us all successful is for tackling hard problems together to buy down risk uh, and make a difference. Do what we're used to doing in our DARPA programs, which is to show that things are possible tomorrow that we didn't realize were possible today. So as we go through the afternoon, we're gonna hear uh, from some different perspectives, uh, but the way that uh, this really has the impact is by developing those new technologies, which then become new capabilities, and those new capabilities may be military capabilities. Uh, we may be wanting to use those technologies to shoot down a missile or jam a radar. Uh, but you may also use those same technologies to create new commercial products and even completely new markets. So uh, as we go through sort of the, the uh, afternoon, I thought I would start with just a little bit of history. Uh, something about Detroit, uh, I think maybe is making everybody a little nostalgic. Uh, and talk about some of the history uh, that we heard about this morning uh, in the perspective of collaboration. So uh, Bill talked this morning uh, about the arsenal of democracy. Uh, this was you know, aerospace and uh, automotive industry coming together, uh, defense of democracy and freedom uh, at home and abroad. And he talked about the long tail of impact that this had, the, the expertise in manufacturing, uh, and the leadership that it created for decades to come. Uh, there's a very similar story for electronics. Uh, many of you probably know, it's pretty well documented, that the innovations that were made in radar technology during World War II changed the outcome of the war. Uh, but it also had a long-lasting impact, uh, and that impact came from very similar manufacturing expertise. Uh, the British during the war did not know, you know what it was they were seeing. They saw radar systems that were being taken out of the box and they just worked. Uh, so it was this really, this expertise in manufacturing that led to decades of leadership in microwave and RF and radar technology. There were ancillary impacts as well. So manufacturing capacity for CRTs, for radar displays, led to a dramatic growth in consumer television industry immediately after the war. So again, these partnerships creating, you know, the, the, the people who win create these new technologies, new markets, new products. Uh, and John told us this morning about early computing as well. Uh, so early computing was really initially trying to focus on very, very hard problems, but these were national security problems. They were modeling nuclear reactions or breaking codes or calculating ballistics. Um, but it was around this time that people started to think about how you architect electronic computers how you write software for them, how you program them. And again, there is a long legacy, a, a decades-long legacy uh, that we are still benefiting from. Because when we got to the 60s and the dawn of transistors and also the integrated circuit, it was the DOD and the US government that immediately started trying to use this technology and apply it to hard problems. And John told us about some of those problems earlier. So it was thing like, things like uh, space missions, very strategic problems. And it was also very specifically strategic defense mission, missions. Uh, so the guidance system 
uh, for the Saturn rocket, but it was also the guidance system for the Minuteman missile. But the companies that were working with the government at the time that really created that lasting impact were the ones who took that technology that they developed in partnership with the government and created new markets and new products, whether it was a transistor radio or calculators or eventually many computers and even the personal computer. In the 1980s, the problem was a different one. Uh, and the problem in the 80s was rapid innovation uh, in other countries. In the 1980s, it was Japan. And the progress that was being made there was threatening leadership in the United States, and part of the response was the formation of Symatec. Symatec, as John mentioned earlier, was a partnership between the DOD, DARPA, uh, and the commercial and semiconductor industry, uh, both contributing cost share to tackle shared problems, to tackle some of the innovation that was needed, again, to manufacture more efficiently, but ultimately it was meant to uh, reduce the innovation cycle, uh, to run faster, to create better technologies, uh, and to regain technical leadership. And if you look at the companies that participated, again, a long impact uh, of that partnership. So here we are, it's ERI, and you know, the premise, as I mentioned earlier, is that these partnerships are as relevant today uh, as they were at any time in the past. Uh, so how do we make that work? And that, to me, is exactly what this afternoon's uh, session is about. So how do we do that? Uh, in ERI, it's a pretty simple model, uh, and I think it's learning a lot of the lessons from the things that have worked in the past. It's talking about taking a very difficult problem, a hard technology problem, and working together to, again, make things possible uh, that we don't know how to do today, but then leveraging uh, the benefits of that for capabilities that might be commercial, they might be uh, national, security, national security focused. And so this is really uh, the, the structure for this afternoon. You'll hear from uh, the commercial perspective in some cases, from the DOD perspective in some cases. Uh, and then you'll hear from some of the ERI performers themselves who are working to create some of these technologies uh, that can make some of these future applications possible. So just to walk through the afternoon, uh, the first thing that we're going to hear about is security, particularly talking about the SIF program, which is trying to tackle a very foundational problem, which is how you create uh, hardware design tools that provide inherent security against hardware vulnerabilities without dramatically impacting the performance of the chip. So we'll hear from Todd Austin about some of the work that he's doing on the Sith program, but first we'll hear from Joe Canary talking about one of, the potential, one of the potential applications, which is protecting the integrity of our elections. Uh, there's nothing more foundational I can think of to our democracy uh, than trusting the results of our elections. And of course, security, whether it's a commercial application or a DOD application, it's something that we all care about. Uh, so there are a lot of systems that you know, commercial industry is going to build. Uh, we need to protect our electrical grid, we need to protect our health records, uh, but then they're just uh, as important uh, military applications on the other side. Uh, we need to protect our command and control centers and we need to make sure that our weapon systems are gonna work the way that they're supposed to when we need them. Next, we're gonna hear about specialization. Uh, so specialization uh, is something that we're doing particularly in the DSOC program, the Domain Specific System on Chip program. And the foundational challenge is creating uh, domain-specific languages and domain-specific architectures, and I can't say uh, you know, in, a, in a more uh, effective way than John Hennessy did during his plenary talk uh, at the ARI Summit last year on how critical this is in terms of an opportunity to continue to make progress uh, moving forward. How you can actually make these architectures uh, that are both you know, effective uh, in a broad range uh, of applications within a domain, but how you make them easy to program and take the burden off the programmer uh, from being an expert in every piece of hardware uh, that he or she is gonna touch. So we'll hear from Mark Horowitz uh, from Stanford University, who's developing some of this technology, but we're also going to hear about an application that I think is relevant both to commercial uh, and DOD applications, and that's space networks, because we're very quickly going to fill up the networks the way that we 
have them architected today, the bent pipe architectures, we are very quickly going to have too many sensors and too few pipes. And so we'll hear from Jesse Mee from the Air Force Research Labs. to talk about how specialized hardware and space uh, can allow us to rethink, to reinvent how we create uh, more effective space networks. Again, many applications for this, both commercial in nature from 5G to image processing uh, to very military specific, advanced radars and electronic warfare. We're also gonna talk about data analytics. Uh, the Software Defined Hardware Program is asking a very uh, challenging question, which is how you can create a runtime reconfigurable uh, architecture that adapts on the microsecond time scale with no human in the loop. So uh, processors that actually change in response to the data and the workloads that they're seeing so that you can get near ASIC-like performance for a wide range of applications. So we're gonna hear from David Winsloff, who's working on that program, who also has a very interesting perspective uh, on specialization itself uh, and some of the limitations. Then we're gonna talk about uh, one of the potential applications that again, I think is relevant to everybody, and that's cloud networking. Uh, and so we'll hear, in this case, a commercial uh, application from Mark Ryland, Amazon Web Services, talking about some of the challenges and opportunities uh, in the cloud. Uh, and, and what I think is very interesting is the potential to have hardware that actually adapts uh, to the software, to the problem, uh, rather than trying to put uh, specialization uh, into the hardware uh, the other way around and into the cloud. Uh, again, uh, limitless applications for this, you know, from financial markets to AI to very specific DOD, you know, complex graph problems. We're gonna talk about artificial intelligence and getting away from these static neural networks uh, that can be fragile uh, and prone to catastrophic failure and surprise. And moving to a new generation of AI that learns from experience and that adapts in the field and adapts in real time. So we'll hear from Praveen Pilly at HRL about some of the work that they're doing uh, to make this a reality. Uh, and in this case, we're actually gonna hear from both uh, the commercial and the DOD perspective on you know, the, the promise and the challenges for autonomy. And uh, you, know, you can again think of many different new commercial markets uh, and new DOD applications uh, that this could enable. And then finally, we're gonna talk a little bit about innovation itself. Um, we'll hear you know, from company like, companies like Intel uh, who are having to use more and more data uh, to make effective hardware and companies like Google who are having to focus more and more uh, on hardware uh, to be effective as a software company. Uh, and then we'll hear from Ilan Gur uh, talking about the potential role for entrepreneurship and small businesses uh, in this ecosystem uh, where it's challenging to do anything but start up you know, a, new, a new software company. Uh, so very excited about the afternoon. Uh, I do want to mention uh, that as we go through the day, uh, we are gonna have uh, one uh, change from the program. So uh, if you're looking at your program and when we get to uh, the 240 time slot for the future of the cloud, uh, we're actually going to move that section uh, of the day to the end of the day. Uh, so starting at 240, we're gonna have a break. Everything the rest of the afternoon is gonna move up by a half hour. Uh, I've had a few uh, travel difficulties. I'm sure you've all had them. Uh, and so we're gonna have uh, both Amazon and David Wensloff uh, at the end of the day. Uh, so very much looking forward to that. Uh, so you know, I'm very excited about the afternoon. Uh, I hope that you uh, really sort of get what I get from uh, this session you know, which is you know, the opportunities that we all have to work together. I couldn't be more excited to see such a wide range uh, of people here from all parts of the ecosystem, from the defense base to the government, uh, to the commercial industry, to academia, here to figure out how we can work together uh, to, again, make all of us better at what it is we're trying to do from a stronger national ecosystem and industry uh, to helping to protect our men and, men and women in uniform. Uh, 